You probably saw the news that the US added nearly 1 million fewer jobs last year than it originally reported, an adjustment that came out weeks after the head of the Bureau of Labor Statistics was fired on allegations from the White House of manipulating job market data. Both of these events sparked a ton of debate online because, up until this point, people generally assumed that job market data was a good and reliable lens for understanding the US economy. But I've got some bad news for you guys. This situation is way worse than you think. I spent the past eight years analyzing, consulting, and teaching about the job market at the federal, corporate, K-12, and university levels. And the dirty truth is that all job market data is bad. Non-farm payroll data is bad. Unemployment data is bad. Salary data is bad. Career placement data for college grads is bad. And the data your uncle uses on Facebook to go tell you to become a welder is bad. Every speck of job market data that we have from the peak of Mount Olympus down to the depths of Tartarus is deeply flawed. So as someone generally qualified to talk about this, I want to cut through all of the noise and the political propaganda and really just explain exactly what's going on. And it's a lot to go over, so please be sure to like this video, subscribe if you are new, and let's just get right into it. We'll get to where those 900,000 jobs went in just a minute, but let's zoom out and look at unemployment data as a whole. The official unemployment rate in the US is currently 4.3%, a number that the BLS gets by taking the amount of unemployed people divided by the total labor force times 100. So right off the bat, you'll notice that this is calculating based off the labor force and not the US population, but there are some good reasons for this. If you calculated unemployment based off population, then that would include children, retirees, stay-at-home moms, and literally everyone else who either won't or can't be employed anyway, and would make the unemployment rate 40.1%, which is just not a useful number, outside of it being mildly interesting that over a third of Americans don't actually work. But here's where that official 4.3% gets sticky. In order to be considered unemployed, you have to be without a job, available to work, and have applied to a job in the past four weeks. If you are underemployed, so let's say that you only work one hour every week mowing the lawn outside of your dad's business, then you don't count. If you are marginally attached, meaning that you want a job but you haven't actively looked in over four weeks, then you don't count. And if you are discouraged, meaning that you gave up on the job search, then you do not count either. This is where you get that discourse about there being a crisis of young men dropping out of the workforce. Because there are 251,000 discouraged male workers in the US right now who have given up on looking for a job, a 25% increase from last year who, notably, are not counted in unemployment data. Now, I wanna be perfectly clear that I'm not making a judgment on this because female discouragement has actually shot up even worse in that same time, even though the total amount of discouraged female workers is lower than the total amount of discouraged males. But if you've ever seen this conversation online, that's like where this data is coming from. So the problem with the official unemployment rate in the US is that it's based off something called the U3 unemployment employment measure, which is this number, which again does not include discouraged or marginally attached people. If it did, then the official unemployment rate would be based off the U5 or the U6 measure, which is currently 5.3 to 8.1 percent, and is double the official unemployment rate that's used by news outlets and government agencies. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Unemployment data also ignores when people are working multiple multiple jobs, don't have reliable hours, aren't making enough money to pay their bills, or are lying about if they've applied to a job in the past four weeks in order to keep getting unemployment benefits. So when I look at job market economics, I default to assuming that the real situation in America
America is probably about twice as bad as the reports are saying for precisely these reasons. And that's not just me being cynical, it's just me being honest about the fact that official data reports ignore half of the problem for the sake of convenience and consistency. And is also why I'm not surprised that the BLS adjusted the total number of jobs added to the US economy down by 911,000 from last year. Adjustments like this actually happen all the time, but we tend to not pay attention to it in the news because the White House never comes out accusing the bureau head of manipulating job market data. See, non-farm payroll in the US, which is the total amount of jobs that exists, is calculated through the current employment statistics survey, which samples 629,000 work sites across the country. It is an insanely monumental undertaking, and you can understand why adjustments don't happen for months at a time. But the scale of this approach is not its only problem. A huge chunk of the workforce is simply not counted in current employment statistics. Self-employed people, farm workers, domestic workers, and gig workers like Uber drivers all do not count. On top of that, non-farm payroll only counts jobs and not people. If one person is working two jobs, then that means that two jobs exist in the eyes of non-farm payroll, despite one person working both of them, which is a statistical problem in a country where 9 million people have more than one job. Non-farm payroll is also calculated specifically on the 12th of every month, which is, you know, in the first half. <laughs> So if any economic disruptors happen over those next two weeks, like layoffs, back to school, or all of those temporary retail workers leaving once Black Friday or Christmas is over, then that does not get reflected in a single month's data. And is another part of why we see these reports lose hundreds of thousands of jobs that were initially estimated to be there. But I don't wanna stray too much into current events. If you're subscribed to this channel, then you know that my professional expertise has always been on the early career job market, specifically what's impacting 18 to 30 year olds. But here's the thing, it is un- fathomably difficult to get a real sense of what college majors lead to what salaries, what entry-level professionals in a field are actually making, and what jobs are even willing to hire people straight out of college or high school to begin with. One of the only real data sets nationally that we have on this is the first destination survey run by NACE. And while it does lay out average starting salaries for every single college major, it only covers 300 of the six 6,000 post-secondary schools in the United States, and only has a knowledge rate of 65%, meaning that about a third of college students who receive the survey don't fill it out. So even though we have data on about 800,000 college graduates every year, we are still missing four bits of the entry-level workforce. And again, like all previous surveys, First Destination has some serious flaws. Just because somebody majored in marine biology does not mean that they are working as a marine biologist. Major does not equal career outcome, and that is not reflected in the first destination survey. It only reports employment status. So if a computer science grad just isn't able to land a job as a programmer, but still gets nepotismed into daddy's law firm as a paralegal anyway, then the first destination survey is going to look at that and say, see, this computer science grad was employed six months after graduation and was making $90,000 a year, regardless of what that individual's career goals were or how they got that job. And that lack of nuance is a serious limitation to how useful this data is, which is a problem that we see across the entire entry-level job market. On most job boards, entry-level does not mean entry-level, because they ask for three to five years of relevant experience before being willing to hire someone. So job market reports from places like Indeed, LinkedIn, and so on also end up not being valuable because they don't reflect the real job market. A whopping three quarters 
of all professional jobs never make their way onto public online job boards, and are instead filled via networking, which will look different based on what career level that job is hiring for. A truly entry-level job, for example, might get hired at, say, a college career fair, because, let's face it, it's a lot easier to recruit directly from a college when you need to hire 20 entry-level mechanical engineers than it would be to post all 20 of those positions to LinkedIn and hope that someone with the ABET accreditation necessary to do that job applies. And at the mid to senior level, managers already know so many other professionals working in the field at their competitors that things like word of mouth referrals or straight up poaching becomes increasingly more common the more high paying a job is. Unless you work at a toxic company with a lot of turnover, or unless you're a restaurant, retailer, or small business that's really only trying to hire locally, then online public job boards are just not going to be that useful for you. Which is why we can't really trust their data about the state of the job market either. And to continue to make matters worse, Functionally, all salary data in the United States is worthless for a few reasons. Ultra high earners heavily skew national averages upwards, which is why the average salary in this country is $64,000 a year, despite the median being 43. But even that 43 heavily skews our perception of the reality of compensation in this country. Taxes, insurance, and other payroll deductions can cause some serious differences in take home pay depending on what state you live in. For example, Oregon has a high state income tax, while Washington has no state income tax at all. So someone making 100k in Portland would have nearly the same monthly take home pay as someone making $80,000 a year in Seattle because federal taxes and payroll deductions also increase with base salary. Now, obviously, rent, gas, groceries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, will vary from city to city and state to state, but that's kind of precisely the point. Salary is not equivalent to take-home pay or purchasing power across the board, and is why trying to calculate household income is another incredibly flawed metric. Our most recent data lists the median household income in America as $80,610, which douchebags who write personal finance books will then use to argue that every family has 5,000 disposable dollars every month to budget. Problem is, that's insanely not true. Household income combines the salary of every single person living in one unit. So if you have four broke-ass roommates who all make $10 an hour, then those four people will get marked down as living in an above-median income household. From there, that household's nominal income, which is just the total amount of money that they have, gets adjusted with the consumer price index for all urban consumers. Problem is, the Bureau of Labor Statistics then makes what's called a hedonic adjustment to the consumer price index, which completely ignores inflation if a product got better in quality. So let's say that Pokemon Legends Arceus got released on the Nintendo Switch for $60, and then Pokemon Legends ZA and its DLC gets released on the Nintendo Switch 2 for $100. To you as the consumer, it now costs 66% more to play a new Pokemon game than it did three years ago. But in the eyes of Uncle Sam, the fact that it's on a new console and the fact that it comes comes with an optional add-on means that the product got better in quality, and therefore no consumer inflation took place. I'm sure you can imagine where this starts to become a problem in calculating inflation, especially when you consider that housing only counts towards one third of the consumer price index, and is why some economists argue that the rampant increase of housing costs since 2020 aren't being factored into official cost of living reports, which is also why a 
official reports claim that American households are now three times richer than they were in 1990, despite them actually having 30% less money left over after their living expenses. All of the data is bad. Anyone who says that the US is doing better economically is probably lying to you for political gain. Anyone who says that the US is adding more jobs is probably manipulating you. Anyone who says that unemployment is not currently a problem, particularly amongst young men and women in their 20s, is full of sh**. And anyone who tries to tell you that a certain career or college major is worthless and that you should just go into the trades instead is completely making that idea up. Probably, again, for political gain. There is no economic truth of the United States that doesn't become functionally worthless as soon as you zoom out from the individual. Successful personal finance was, is, and always will come down to doing one of two things. You either need to make the amount of money coming in go up, or you need to make the amount of money going out come down. That's literally all of personal finance. The end. <laughs>